Okay, good morning, everybody. It's um it's a pleasure to uh, to bring to you our our most recent, well, our current micro seminar for uh, the first day of May. So happy May Day, everybody. Um, uh, uh, as as before, um, all the all the questions and comments will be uh, conducted through uh, the chat box on uh, on YouTube Live. So uh, if you're if you're following along on YouTube Live, just go ahead and enter your questions there, and we'll we'll bring them to you later. So it's a it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Ashish Malik, who's a lecturer, uh, or for those of you who don't speak uh, uh, um, uh, UK system, uh, that's an assistant professor at uh, of biogeochemistry at the University of Aberdeen, Scotland. Um, Ashish, Ashish has had a, has an amazing career. He's traveled all over the place as a scientist. So for those of you who are interested in how scientists get to where they are, he's got a really really cool story. He, uh, he did a, a bachelor's uh, a degree at Goa University in India, a master's uh, in microbiology at Bangalore University in India, and then he switched to a PhD in soil biogeochemistry at the Max Planck Institute for Biogeochemistry in Jena. Uh, his advisor there was Gerd uh, Gleitzner, and he did a, went on to do a postdoctoral fellowship there as well with the same advisor. Then he had a Marie uh, Sklodowska Curie Fellowship at the NERC Center for Ecology and Hydrology at Wallingford and University of Oxford uh, in Oxford. And his advisor there was Robert Griffith, Griffiths. And then he did a final postdoc as a USDOE genomics, genomic sciences postdoctoral scholar at UC Irvine with Steve Allison. And uh, so since November, he's been at the University of Aberdeen. And uh, I'm going to, I'm going to let uh, Ashish take it away from here. So thank you very much for being with us today, Ashish. Thanks a lot. Um, I'm going to share the screen first. Um, all right. Thanks a lot for inviting me um, to present. It's it's an honor. I've I've seen these seminars. Uh, with the microscope um, and always quite interesting. And it's a, it's a great format, which makes a particular sense now that we are in this lockdown. And I hope that everyone is doing well and taking care of themselves. Um, it's, it's, it's strange times and we should be, we should not be taking ourselves too harshly, professionally speaking. Um, so I'm going to talk today about um, microbial communities and soils and how we can link them to soil carbon cycling and the anthropogenic change. And I, I've been doing this using a unique trade-based uh, framework. Um, and this has been possible because of, uh, because of my work in some great labs. Um, most of the research I'll be presenting today is from my uh, two postdocs, first um, at the Center for Ecology and Hydrology, and then at the University of California, Irvine. And this, this research has been made possible because um, of funding from various funding agencies, uh, primarily the Department of Energy and uh, the EU-funded uh, Marie Curie Fellowship. I'll be, I'll be showing um, my papers and um, all of that um, through the seminar, um, but all the details can be found in my website um, uh, with links uh, to the papers, most of which are open access. So there will be some more soil uh, seminars in the, in the weeks to come. So this is a great way uh, for me to introduce soils to you um, um, and, and why microbes are so important. Um, in the terrestrial carbon cycle. So we know that soils store a lot of carbon. There's more carbon in soils than in the entire atmosphere and uh, all the vegetation put together. And this is a very dynamic carbon pool in the terrestrial carbon cycle. And microorganisms are at the center of the below ground carbon cycling. Uh, they, de they determine how much of the carbon will remain in the soil. And so they act as gatekeepers of uh, soil atmosphere carbon exchange. And growth yield is an important trait of uh, microbial communities. 
in a sense that it really determines how much of that carbon will go into the microbial biomass and then end up in the soil organic matter and how much of, of the carbon is lost as CO2 back to the atmosphere. But if we look at the bigger picture at the whole below ground ecosystem, um, then there are other abiotic processes as well. And, and the interplay between these biotic and abiotic processes really determines um, the magnitude of changes in the soil carbon pool. And, in, and with that perspective, decomposition and stabilization, that, which are the two main uh, processes of soil carbon cycling become really important. So I just want to highlight that it's not just the microbial processes that we need to study, but also the mechanisms by which microbes interact with the environment in the microhabitat in soils. And there are various processes, processes here. There's the physical excess of microbes to organic matter. Once microbes have eaten up organic matter, uh, the necromass, the dead biomass, then interacts with the mineral fractions and the organo-mineral interactions determine how much of that carbon ends up accumulating as soil organic matter. Also the transport medium, water or liquid or, and gas exchanges in the soil environment really determines how a microbes excess resources. So it's really crucial to look at it as an, as an ecosystem and study it together. And, and because microbes are so central in below ground carbon cycling, they can also be part of the solutions uh, to some of the key challenges that we face as a society today. One of them is land use intensification, which has led to a, a big loss in, in the soil carbon um, pool. There are some estimates which suggest that historically we've lost about 130 gigatons of carbon because of agricultural land use. Uh, and this is, this is equal to the amount of carbon that's lost from the vegetation due to deforestation. And just compare that with the amount of soil carbon that currently exists. It's about a 10% that's been lost. And we need to keep this carbon in the, in the ground and microbes can play a crucial role in this, uh, in, in this challenge of sequestering carbon in soil, which is very important also from soil health perspectives. The other challenge obviously is climate change and climate change is changing the way microbes uh, survive, grow and persist in soils. And this will, will, will then change the, the soil atmosphere carbon exchange and, and there are many feedbacks to the climate change process that we need to study. So, so knowing the mechanisms of microbial carbon cycling and how they interact with the environmental parameters is really crucial. Um, and, and like I said, it can, microbes can also be part of the solutions uh, here. But what's, what's, What's the knowledge gap here is that we have tremendous amount of microbiome data that we are generating. Modern molecular tools uh, has, has enabled uh, microbial ecology to really um, get into the details of all the processes, uh, but we, we are not able to really translate that wealth of information that we are generating um, into knowledge that can help us better understand ecosystem processes. So I think there's really a crucial link that has to be made here. And Ed Hall has uh, this really nice review paper, which I, which I highly recommend, which vouches for this integration of, uh, of two fields um, to really understand how microbiome processes are impacting systems level processes. And what I've been doing is trying to look at uh, trait-based approaches in microbial ecology and, and gaining some of, the, some of the similar experiences in 
uh, in macro ecological concepts and other other ecological fields like plant ecology. This is a classical trade based uh, framework, the CSR framework, uh, which which came out in in the seventies, put forth by Grime, um, which really um, is is quite a classical trade based concept, which suggests that plants. Um, structure themselves on, on, on these two gradients of stress and disturbance. Um, and you have competitors growing really well in, in environments which are, which are not stressed and which are not disturbed. And you have um, stress tolerators growing extremely well um, in stressed environments because they've developed tolerance mechanisms. And they, so they, they, they can really find a niche there for themselves. And we have really fast turnover plants like, like grasses, uh, which are ruderals, which grow really well in high disturbance environments. So a similar concept can be applied to microbial ecology to really understand species uh, 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 distribution across environments. Um, but then, such gradients don't, uh, don't really map well onto microbes because the way microbes see stress and disturbance is very different both in spatial and temporal scales. Also, um, microbes can grow everywhere. So there are no environments where microbes would not grow. Uh, so so based, on, based on this concept, what are the key microbial traits um, that we can we can talk about, especially in terms of carbon cycling, but generally speaking as well. Growth yield can be equated to the competitor uh, strategy uh, of plants, but this has some limitations because higher growth rate does not really mean higher growth yield in microorganisms. There can be a really fast growing uh, species which doesn't really grow very efficiently. Stress, obviously, microbes also see um, extremes in abiotic environments as stress, and then they respond to that. So this is a trait that can be mapped pretty easily. But then microbes also rely on an external source of carbon and energy. So unlike plants, acquiring resources becomes a really important uh, process. So that, that, that is also a very important trait. So based on some of the understanding that we have in the microbial world um, and, um, and, and a trait-based concepts that, that have been applied previously in microbial ecology, uh, particularly some examples of how CSR can be applied to microbial world, we put forth um, a microbial framework to infer life history strategies. And this is and we call this YAS, uh, which is the high growth yield, resource acquisition, stress tolerance, YAS framework. Um, and what, what we suggest here is that microbes structure themselves in environments along two main axes. And, and the two main gradients that matter are that of stress and resources. And under minimum stress and ample resources, high yield strategists will, will, will outcompete others. And, um, and in, in places where there, there's a lot of stress, there'll be stress tolerators with, with good, good amount of adaptations and tolerance mechanisms. Um, Acquirers in, in places where substrates are difficult or complex, um, and then a combination of um, stress toler tolerance and resource acquisition traits being very important in really harsh environments. But the, but the basic mechanism behind these trade-offs and then assigning traits to microbes um, so that we can define life history strategies is based on the cellular level physiology. And, th and the hypothesis here is that the cellular level, level allocation means 
that microbes can excel at one trait at the expense of the other. So if we look at a typical metabolism, um, we know that microbes uh, secrete extracellular enzymes uh, to break down complex polymeric substances in the environment. And once they break them down into monomers or oligomers, they are taken up through transporters and then they are passed on into the central carbon metabolism where they can be dissimilated for energy purposes or they can be assimilated to build precursor compounds. And these precursor compounds can then be uh, used for growth or non-growth uh, purposes. And this is where we think there is a trade-off um, in this cellular level allocation of resources. So if there's investment into biomass, then fine. But if there is, if there is investment into non-growth purposes for stress tolerance or for acquiring of complex resources from, from the environment, then there's a clear trade-off. Higher the non-growth production, lower is the investment into biosynthesis and lower is the growth yield, which then has consequences for ecosystem processes such as decomposition and, and necromass production, uh, leading to stabilization in the soil mineral matrix. So I will give two um, examples of empirical data sets that I've generated through my previous um, projects. The first one is from the UK, and here we've looked at how microbial traits um, differ across land use gradients. Uh, this was part of a bigger project, um, which was trying to understand um, soil carbon cycling mechanisms. So samples were collected across 28 sites. Um, and at each site, we had a paired contrast of, um, of varying land use intensities and three replicates at each of those sites. Um, so the paired contrasts were often next to each other. So they are local. Uh, this, this meant that they have similar climatic conditions and uh, similar parent material. Um, an ideal, ideal setup to really look at the uh, impact of land use intensification, um, above ground uh, management on soil microbial processes and how, how it translates then into um, carbon accumulation in these soils. So uh, we know that these land use, uh, the land use intensification from pristine or low intensity to high intensity leads to a lot of so loss of soil carbon. So we really, really wanted to look if, if we can find linkages of microbial traits to soil carbon uh, concentrations and stocks in soils. So what, to measure traits, we took a quantitative approach. Uh, we measured growth yield as community carbon use efficiency. And for that, we, measure, we added a 13C labeled plant litter DOC uh, to small amount of soils that were collected from all those sites. Uh, and we then partitioned that 13C into the DNA of uh, microbial community and also measured how much of that 13C ends up in the respired CO2. The DNA measurements were done using an LC-IRMS and the 13C measurements using a gas bench IRMS. And then we measured the carbon use efficiency as the amount that goes in, into the biomass against um, the rest um, of the investment. So here I'll be showing on the x-axis the soil organic carbon content of, of the soils. And on the y-axis is the growth yield measured as carbon use efficiency. And this is showing all the, all the sites regardless of their land use intensity. And what we saw here was quite a cloud of points, but then really going into the details of where these points, where these um, soils came from, we, we figured out that the low pH soils had a really low carbon use efficiency because the communities, the microbes were not really growing that much in these soils. Whereas in the high pH soils, we saw a clear relationship 
um, of uh, carbon use efficiency, soil carbon content. So we, we, we hypothesized that there are two distinct mechanisms of carbon storage um, in soils across a pH threshold, which we found for this set of um, samples to be 6.2. Um, at low pH, uh, there's retardation of organic matter decomposition because of uh, acidic, um, wet environment. Um, and so there's minimal microbial growth here, whereas in higher soil pH above um, the threshold, uh, we found that microbial growth yield um, correlates with soil carbon, and, and, and the mechanism here could be that because of higher growth yield, they produce a, a lot more microbial biomass, and that then has leads to um, higher carbon accumulation. And we put this data then into a statistical framework to really look at uh, the causality. So we used path analyses of structural equation modeling uh, to see the linkages of growth yield to biomass and soil carbon. And we found that in higher pH soils, higher carbon use efficiency translates into more biomass. And having more biomass uh, means there is more soil carbon accumulation that that wasn't the case in low pH soils. So this was just um, the linkages for all the samples that we saw um, for a key microbial trait, growth yield to soil carbon content. We then wanted to look at how microbial physiology is changing with land use intensification. So here we always compared uh, a pristine or low intensity um, or unmanaged grassland to um, a high intensity managed uh, cropland, um, often arable. And I'll be showing here mostly um, the effect sizes of intensification. And, and here I'm only showing 11 of those pairs uh, which were both about pH 6.2, but the other contrasts are, are reported in, in the paper. Um, so what, what really um, is seen here is that with intensification, pH goes up, and this is quite well known, um, and this is because of liming or fertilization, um, and we have loss of soil carbon with intensification. And there's also decrease in soil moisture. And this is, this is quite an um, intuitive thing. Um, we have uh, lower organic matter in the high intensity soils. Uh, it means the soils are dry, they, uh, they lose the aggregate structure. So they're also quite um, dry and, and, and stressful for microorganisms. So what about the microbial physiology? We saw that carbon use efficiency goes down with intensification, but growth rate goes up with intensification. So as, as a community here, we are finding that there, there are high, high fast growing uh, populations in the community, um, but they are not really very efficient in these intensive systems. And this leads to reduction in biomass in these soils, um, but also um, increase in biomass specific respiration, at least in some of the soils that we measured. So this really shows you how microbial physiology is clearly linked to soil carbon accumulation across um, these um, land use contrasts that we measured. And then to really understand more the details of what, what the mechanisms are, we, we did um, soil proteomics um, with a subset of, of land use contrasts. And this work was done in collaboration with Nico Yemlich um, at OFZ Leipzig. Um, and here we found that in the pristine um, soils, there are a lot of ABC transporters, both in both higher, num higher frequency of transporters, but also higher abundances of these transporters. 
Um, and this really suggests that these pristine environments that are rich and diverse in organic uh, matter content has provides a good supply of organic matter to microbial communities. And this is an easy way to gain resources from the environment. They just have to suck these substrates in. So they use these transporters, which could be one of the reasons why we see high growth yield in these systems. Whereas in the high intensity or the arable croplands, we see a lot of stress proteins, again, indicating that these are stressed systems and microbes really are struggling here. They are investing a lot into maintenance purposes. And that, that may be over a longer period of time lead to loss of carbon um, in these intensive systems. We also looked at um, the extracellular enzyme potential um, of microbial communities across these um, soils. And here I'm showing all the sites which were, which were higher than pH 6.2. So above that threshold that we found. Um, and, and the carbon enzymes that we used were beta glucosidase and acetyl esterase. Um, and this was corrected for uh, biomass. So this is the investment or the potential enzyme investment per unit biomass. And we see a nice trend negative correlation here between growth yield and resource acquisition measured through potential enzyme activity. Um, and what was really interesting was when we overlaid the soil organic carbon content over this uh, distribution pattern, we saw that most of the uh, pristine sites or the low intensity sites with high organic matter had higher growth yield, but they had lower extracellular enzyme uh, investment, which means that there's a clear trade-off between um, resource acquisition uh, traits and growth yield traits. And in the arable sites, or the high intensity sites with less amount of uh, soil organic matter, we saw a lot of uh, um, higher amount of enzyme investment. So this, this clearly shows uh, a nice trade-off in these two traits. So what, what we found here was that in the, in the pristine or the low intensity sites, um, the microbial communities here are mostly the high growth yield strategies, whereas in the in the high intensity uh, high high intensity arable croplands, um, the the strategies can vary from resource acquisition to stress tolerance, depending on on the amount of organic matter in these soils, as well as the the aridity, the aggregate structure, um, and other microhabitat conditions. Moving on to sunny California, from where I'll, I'll demonstrate uh, the second example of how this trade-based framework can be applied to link microbial communities to ecosystem processes. Uh, this, is a, this is from the Loma Ridge Global Change Experiment, where there's a long-term drought experiment going on since 2007. This is an ecosystem with a mosaic of grass and shrub. Um, in Southern California. And here we tried to look at the microbial traits across um, this precipitation gradient. Um, and, and we know that um, drought um, leads to lower decomposition rates, uh, not just because, um, because uh, water stress is a physiological constraint on microbes, but also because in soils, um, uh, there is less amount of diffusion. So, so there's a, the transport medium is also getting affected by drought and therefore microbes will have less access to resources. So here the experiment um, includes um, grass and shrub ecosystems across a precipitation gradient of ambient and reduced and the reduced precipitation involved 40 to 50% reduction in precipitation, which was done mostly through, um, through the, through the, through sheds that were 
only covered during the winter season where when much of the precipitation occurs in in these mediterranean ecosystems and we did um, a litter decomposition experiment um, uh, using litter bags litter bags are ideal uh, experimental systems because these are closed so you can really measure litter mass loss but you can also measure community succession in these closed systems the litter bags that i used were were not really microbial cages so which are which are widely used in in various litter bag experiments but they were open cages um so that and the mesh size was 1 mm and this was to to maintain real um real world um situation so so we have a uh, litter bags that were placed on the soil surface in grass and shrub um shrub ecosystems um and you can see here that the shrub e uh, shrub litter was quite diverse um and it looked something like that um and the grass litter was uh, was more or less um similar in 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 chemical sense so what we have here is a, a nice precipitation gradient which acts as a stress gradient and we also have a resource gradient because the shrub um litter was more complex and more diverse uh, whereas the grass litter consisted more of uh, carbohydrate cellulose hemicellulose um and solubles uh, whereas shrub had more lignin and more aromatic compounds Uh, but also a more diversity of substrates in the shrub litter and what we hypothesized um was uh, that in the in the grass ambient uh there will be high high yield strategist because this is a less stress easy substrate environment um stress tolerators high in the drought um treatment um and acquirers higher in the shrub because of the complex leaf litter and what we then suggested uh, hypothesized is that higher yield strategies a uh, strategy would mean that um there is higher uh, litter decomposition rates because um because there's more more amount uh, higher biomass levels here so there's a bigger community that can decay um organic substrates followed by grass reduced uh, and then grass uh, shrub uh, ambient followed by shrub reduced shrub reduced uh, would be the worst because here the microbial communities have not 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 only the the physiological constraints of a uh, water stress but also the constraint of growing on a, a on a more complex and diverse uh, leaf litter so we did a we did a leaf litter um decomposition experiment so leaf litter was collected um in the summer of 2017 and uh, and here i'm showing the cumulative precipitation since 2007 um and you can see that already there has been a significant reduction in the reduced treatment and then the sheds are covered in the reduced treatment in drought which means that there's a um, lower amount of precipitation in the drought treatment the first sampling was done in at the end of the dry season uh in november and this is where we um did a ton of measurements um we measured um we did it shotgun metagenomics at all the time points but then at the time point 1 we also performed a a local wet up experiment um this was the beginning of the wet season and we we measured um gene expression patterns and metabolite profiles um after so at at the time point t1 before wet up after wet up and after two weeks uh so there was no precipitation after that sim single uh, rain event um 
which was simulated. Uh, and then we measured, again, gene expression and metabolite production at the end of, uh, after two weeks, which was the dry down. Um, and, and you will see this later again as well. Um, just to show some pictures of how the litter looked like. Uh, this is at the end of the experiment. Um, so we collected um, at the end of the wet season of 1718. And then at the end of the summer was the third time point. And again, at the end of the wet season of 2018-19, which is a particularly wet uh, winter in Southern California. So the grass litter looked like this. So you can see that it's already breaking apart and the shrub litter as well. Um, and this is the litter mass loss over those time points. Um, and you can see here, it, you will see such plots often. So I'll take some time to really uh, explain these. Um, so this is um, blue R ambient precipitation and red, red R reduced precipitation. And so this is grass and this is shrub here. And you can see that, um, and this is with time, then time point one, two, three, and the fourth one, we could not get reliable data on. And you can see here that in grass, the decomposition rates are faster than in shrub. Um, and, and we do see some indication of higher decomposition rates in grass ambient than drought, but this was not statistically significant. So the drought impact wasn't very clear here. And then we looked at the communities and here I'm showing the community succession during decomposition, decomposition over those 18 months. And this is an NMDS plots, NMDS plot for taxonomic um, and functional units that were measured through shotgun metagenomics. And I'm showing here um, so each point here is from one sample, um, and there were four replicates at each point. So the centroid here is the uh, is the bigger bigger point. And if if points are further apart, it means they are more distinct from each other. The communities are distinct, either taxonomically or functionally. And looking at the, so the first impression is that the, the squares are very um, the, the squares are segregated from the triangles and the squares are uh, representing grass samples and the, sh and the triangles are shrub samples. The red are again from the drought plots and the blue are from the ambient precipitation. And the lighter shades are showing the progression of decomposition. So T1 is darkest and T4 is lightest. And, as, and you can see here that as decomposition progresses, there is a convergence. And this convergence is bigger in functional units than in taxonomy. So by the end of decomposition, not just the grass, not just the precipitation treatments, but also across the vegetation treatments, functionally, they, they appear to be very similar at the end of the experiment not so much in the taxonomic units. And then if we look at the, the alpha diversity, um, again, this is the same plot like I showed before. So Shannon diversity on the y-axis, and I'm showing the progression time one to time four. Um, and you can see that in, in terms of taxonomic alpha diversity, Diversity is really low initially, um, and it goes up with decomposition. And, and the, the shrub uh, plots, the shrub communities overall had higher function, uh, taxonomic as well as functional diversity than grass communities. Uh, and there's some indication that uh, the, the functional diversity actually goes up and then down And if you, if you try to look at the specifics here, um, uh, so here I'm showing only the, the taxonomic uh, units. So these are 
taxa that were in higher abundance initially uh, during the initial stages. And these are the ones that are in higher abundance at the later stages of decomposition. And I'm showing the relative abundances here as reeds percentage. And you can see that in, in shrub ecosystem, there are a lot of differentially abundant taxa. And in the, in the ambient treatment, a lot of those were fungal taxa. So fungi were very important in initial decomposition. But in the drought uh, treatment in grass communities, fungi were important, but actinobacteria were more. So there were 23 taxa belonging to the actinobacterial phyla, which were in higher abundance initially. So this suggests that they could be more drought tolerant. In shrub communities, no clear patterns. And this doesn't mean that uh, uh, there, were, there weren't any taxa that were in high abundance initially. It just means that the, uh, the, the distribution was more flat or consistent across the time points. What about the late taxa? So the taxa that were more abundant at the later stages of decomposition. And, and these were mostly bacteria from diverse phyla and classes. So clear uh, indication here that the fungi are important initially and bacteria come later in the decomposition process. What about functional aspects? So here again, I'm showing functional genes that were significantly higher initially and later so that we can use them as indicators of initial and later stages of decomposition. And here you see that carbohydrates are really important initially, uh, especially in the ambient treatment. And really important things to note down here are some of the stress tolerance mechanisms. So membrane transport, quite important initially, stress response, genes also quite important initially, more so in the drought treatments um, and same with um, iron acquisition and metabolism. And these are all most uh, mostly uh, osmolite uh, related acclimation strategies to water stress. There were also cell wall and capsule um, strategies. Um, so like I said, at time point one, we also did metabolomics and metatranscriptomics, uh, which was through a short uh, wet up experiment. This is here I'm showing the metabolomics data for, for some of the metabolites that were significantly higher in one or the other treatments. This work was done in collaboration with the Berkeley lab um, in uh, Trent Norman's lab. And I'd like to acknowledge Tammy for this work. Um, and here, what we saw here was that um, if you look at um, two uh, indicators of growth, so aspartic acid is a biogenic amino acid and adenosine, which is a nucleoside. If we look at this along, um, os along an osmolite like ectoin, that was significantly higher in the drought treatment particularly in the grass ecosystem. It really, the patterns really show a nice trade-off with some of the growth indicators. So the growth indicators were higher in the ambient and the drought indicators like osmolites were higher in drought. And this trade-off was clearer in, in the grass communities than in the shrub communities. And this, uh, this paper just got accepted in the ISMI journal. We then uh, looked also at the gene expression levels only at the time point one. And here I'm only showing the broad patterns, not with wet up, but with the long-term precipitation treatment. So after 10 years of drought. And what we see here is that in the ambient, you have the normal functions of uh, carbohydrate uh, metabolism and amino acid metabolism. But in the drought treatment, we do see a lot of those carbohydrate uh, genes as well. 
but most of them are actually linked to osmolites, which such as ectoin, choline, betaine, which are carbohydrates, but they are not necessarily uh, for decomposition or, or resource um, substrate purposes. They are more um, more um, osmolite uh, or constitutive um, osmolites, which can be used um, for other metabolic purposes when the when water stresses are gone. But we clearly saw indicators of stress. Um, high, very high numbers of uh, genes um, with increased expression in the drought treatment linked to membrane transport, also linked to stress response and cell wall and capsule. This really shows um, the, the drought response strategies of these communities to survive uh, the drought stress. And to quickly show the wet up induced changes. So this was at the time point one when we actually performed a wet up experiment. And here I'm showing the fold change in gene expression um, of, with the wet up. Um, wet up in, uh, in comparison with the control. So if there is if there's a fold change, so this is a positive fold change, means increased expression, and this the, uh, and negative means decreased, um, so down regulation of gene expression. Um, and the green ones are the ones that are significantly higher in each of, in the in in the wet up or wet wet up related to the control. Um, and what we saw here was that uh, across the grass. Uh, ambient and reduced treatments, outer membrane protein, branch chain amino acid transporter, uh, phosphate transporter were increased in gene expression with the wet up, um, also flagella, and all these uh, indicators of uh, they're probably pumping out osmolites, which are no longer required. Um, and flagella, obviously, because it's a wet environment now. So they can swim up, swim around. And what goes down? Um, so down-regulated genes were mostly linked to stress. Um, this again suggests that there's no stress anymore um, or less stress. Um, so some of these can be down-regulated. It just so we are just demonstrating here some of the changes in gene expression with the wet up experiment. And what about such stress response um, uh, indicators during the decomposition? So across the community succession. Uh, here we saw, here we are looking now at uh, the metagenomics data sets across the 18 month um, sampling. Um, and this is all the genes that we could find uh, that were annotated to membrane transport and stress response um, classes. And here we see that both of these are higher in the drought treatment compared to the ambient across both the vegetation types, which clearly suggests that there is the drought response strategies are mostly linked to osmo osmotic um, acclimation through osmolites, uh, changes in membrane transport, or cell, cell envelope modifications. So often there's an EPS or capsule-like modification um, which act as sponges to retain more water. And what we see here clearly is also that this stress response goes down as decomposition progresses. And th this, could be a, this could be an indicator um, of the, or, or a reflection of the changes in the taxonomic structures because fungi were in high abundance um, at the initial stages. So some of the osmolite acclimation strategies could come from fungi, whereas some of the strategies of cell envelope modifications like EPS and capsule formation could come from bacteria, which actually increase um, uh, at the later stages. So we, we did see those clear st uh, stress adaptations, but what about um, the, the performance of the microbial communities as a whole. So here I'm showing the biomass levels measured as the amount of DNA that was extracted from these communities. Um, and this 
was higher in the grass communities as we expected uh, because the shrub communities are, aren't really growing that well. It's a difficult substrate, but there wasn't, um, a, there wasn't any drought related um, effect on the biomass. We also measured uh, respiration rates and then we corrected them to, to measure, to estimate the biomass specific respiration because this is a better indicator of the physio physiology and the, the metabolic constraints that exist on the communities. And here, as expected, we saw that the shrub communities had higher um, respiration rate than grass communities. And again, there was no evidence to suggest that um, there was a physiological constraint in the drought communities. And this could indicate that there is increased fitness in these um, in the drought communities. So we see clear indications of stress tolerance responses, but it appears that there is not a big trade-off, which then leads to decreased um, growth yield um, in, in the drought communities. Uh, but this could be just um, th this could also be just selection for communities that can adapt and grow well in these environments. But it could also be other uh, mechanisms like adaptation through evolutionary mechanisms. And this is something we are exploring further. So to summarize here, we we did see some indication of decreased uh, decomposition rates in the drought environment, but this wasn't clear. We've actually found decreased decomposition in other experiments. So it really depends on the sampling point and the season, how, how, what were the levels of precipitation in the previous season. Um, so it, it varies a lot. So it doesn't, it doesn't mean we did not find that decomposition leads to reduced growth, uh, reduced decomposition. But from the micro microbial work, we see that the biomass and the respiratory um, quotient wasn't really affected with drought. And it could suggest that there is um, adaptations that are mitigating that, that um, decrease in uh, decomposition rates. Um, just to highlight what, I, what I'll be doing in the future. So you know, my current strategy um, and um, the, the, the key research teams of my, my lab, which, which is being established, um, I've, I've started this position in November, so it's been six months now. Um, and so just like previous, my previous work, I'll be, I'll be looking at um, microbial ecology integrated with ecosystem ecology, uh, but really more focus on uh, populations as well as communities and trying to link both of those to ecosystems. So a multi-scale approach um, to look at physiology and its linkages to ecosystem processes like decomposition, soil carbon stabilization. And again, addressing uh, key challenges um, like sustainable land use, climate uh, also focusing on peatlands, um, big, uh, it's, a, it's a big national priority here. So what specifically are the questions here? So at the, at the population level, I think there is a need to really uh, link genotype to phenotype uh, because there can be many regulatory pathways or mechanisms that disturb or uncouple those linkages. I've seen uh, most of these traits um, at the community level, so it'll be really interesting to look at the cellular level trade-offs that happen. Um, and this could be done by isolating um, the populations and culture or through other, other molecular, um, molecular tools. Or some of the other questions really are at the community level, are the traits inherent? Are they geno genomically coded? A trait like growth yield, is it genomically coded or is it an emergent trait that depends on the microhabitat conditions? And also, I think there is, there is, more, there is need for more quantitative measurements um, 
omics technologies are helping us really understand the mechanisms, but there is more need to develop newer tools that allow us to quantify because that will really help us link these processes to the ecosystem process rates and fluxes. At the ecosystem scale, I think it's really crucial to understand microbial footprints and, uh, and fluxes. Um, so really into linking microbial physiology to ecosystem process through measurements of pools or changes in, in substrates through detailed chemistry. Uh, and this, all this is really to help um, upscale these uh, predictions at, of microbial physiology linking to ecosystem processes. Um, and with, with, with just a quick um, highlights of what, what my plans are for the future, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And it was a great, great pleasure to deliver this seminar. And I'd, I'd be happy to take questions. Great, thank you very much, Ashish. That was that was that was an excellent contribution. Um, we've got a lot of people watching right now. Um, we do have quite a few questions from uh, from the audience. I'm going to start with one from Amit Kumar. Um, how to, uh, I'm going to try and translate this a little bit. How might growth yield change if the microbes are not resource but energy limited? Um, he says this might not be the case for plants given that CO2 and water in ample amount. I guess um, in most most of the microbial um, communities that I've I've been measuring, they're mostly heterotrophs and they rely. The, the organic matter is also the energy source for them. Uh, so it's often not decoupled in the systems that I, I've been focusing on. on. So they're not, they're, they're as energy limited as carbon limited. Okay. Um, Leanne Benning asks, uh, was there a gradient in litter decomposition rate as a function of top slash bottom or outside slash inside uh, parts of the litter bag? Uh, we just had litter at the surface um, but we've done um, we've done other experiments with microbial cages um, which which excludes immigration of communities or immigration or, or even like mesofauna entering and we do see that the decomposition rates are much lower in those microbial cages um, so decomposition is faster in these cages that I used, which were one millimeter mesh size, uh, to allow um, some mesofauna. Um, and it really shows that, um, yeah, that, that there are other processes as well that do matter. Yeah, I, th I think she was getting at, did you measure the differences in, in processes within the litter bag, like the inside to outside, or, or did you just take the whole community and, and grind it yeah, up? That, yeah, that was just the whole, whole uh, litter mass. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, is there any correlation between the percent of N <coughs> remaining in the litter and Shannon diversity? Uh, litter decomposition generally faster during uh, a few months. Uh, this is from Mayana Krishna. So can you say that again? Um, Shannon and what the other one? A percent of N remaining in the litter and Shannon diversity. Uh, I don't think there was a correlation there, no. Okay, uh, we have a multi-part sort of observation slash question from Amit Kumar. In the grass under ambient conditions, why do you think there would be higher growth yield? Uh, it can be just the reverse that only one kind of substrate like grass litter and that also with the high seed in ratio would result in nutrient stress. And then you can put sulfur under those conditions. Um, as a result, microbes start mining nutrients and increase the decomposition of added litter. Uh, yeah. yeah, so we've done a ke detailed chemical analysis of the litter um, and the grass litter is way easier if you look at the 
kind of uh, substrates, um, the proportions of substrates like cellulose and hemicellulose that, that are present in the grass litter. Um, so compared to shrub, obviously, it was way easier for the microbes to degrade. And we see this time and time and time again that the decomposition rates are faster in the grass. And grass ambient because um, obviously there's less stress, but also the drought is changing the plant communities and the plant community change is also having an effect on the litter chemistry. And what we see is that in the drought communities that are often um, often some of these uh, invasive grasses, which often are more woody than, than in the ambient. So, so at the ecosystem scale, there are various uh, reasons why, but the, the, str the lower stress and good, less diverse resources are the main reasons why we thought growth yield would be higher there. Okay. From uh, Maria Cloutier, uh, I wonder how much turnover there would have been in microbial cells between your sampling time points and how that is impacting decomposition of the added substrates. Yeah, so there was definitely turnover because, um, because we see different communities uh, and the, the, there is a clear community succession um, and that is happening across the treatments, but I can't say uh, quantitatively how big that turnover was. Okay. From, uh, from Maya Krishna again, a great work. Have you seen the Shannon diversity turnover along your sampling point to account for the possible influence of, of ecotone or say edge effect? Hmm. Y yeah, so we, we homogenized uh, the litter across the, um, uh, within the bag. And, and what, what you actually saw was that initially there were, the beta diversity was higher across all the time points. Uh, this could be because of um, more um, stochasticity initially um, in the initial stages of community succession. Uh, but it could also be that the substrate is getting more homogeneous towards the end. Um, and there's also, uh, yeah, so the substrate is getting homogeneous and it's, uh, you know, there is less of that heterogeneity in terms of, uh, of just the substrate levels that exists initially. Okay, from Alberto uh, Canarini, uh, I would like to ask, was respiration at the litter level measured? During decomposition, microbial biomass could build up soil C or leave the system. And this is an important point for, for carbon storage. Yeah, so we did measure the CO2 um, respiration rate. Um, and like I showed, um, we, sh we saw that if there was higher biomass that there always tends to be higher respiration as well because there's a bigger pool of communities. So it's good to correct those values to biomass. And once we did that, we get the QCO2. And that actually shows the physiology. If there's a higher respiration rate, that means there's, there's more maintenance pressures in those communities. And I was expecting it to be higher in the drought communities, but we did not see that. Okay. Um, I think there's a follow-up from, from also from Alberto same, same, uh, on this. He says, also, it's quite surprising that drought did not affect litter loss and some more microbial parameters. Do you really think that maybe the drought was not really so stressful? So it's been, it's been 10 years since the drought's been applied and it's changing the plant communities. Um, and we see clear effects of, of the drought. So yes, there are, there are impacts of the drought, but, in, but some years are wetter than others. Um, and what happens is then that even in the reduced treatment, there is enough, uh, enough water potential that it's not stressful enough for microbes. Um, so in some years that are particular, particularly wet, 
um, perhaps the stress effect is not as big, but we've had 10 years of drought now, and we clearly see response of that on plants, but also on decomposition rates. We've not seen significant effects in this experiment, we've, but we've seen them previously at the same site because there are many projects ongoing at the same site. Um, but it could well be that now after 10 years, there's some sort of adaptation in the microbial communities and it's leading to a higher fitness in these communities that uh, you know, the, the, the stress mechanisms mean that they are able to mitigate the negative effects of drought and therefore at the ecosystem level, which we measure as decomposition rates, there is not much of an impact, but it's too early to say that yet. Okay. Uh, one more question um, uh, from Mar Mariana uh, Silva. Excellent talk, thank you. If I understand correctly, are the biggest differences in microbial community composition and gene expression more related to plant species identity than to drought treatment? Yes. So we see they are very different systems, grass and shrub. So the litter is very different. The, the, the shrub ecosystem has a higher canopy. And, you know, so the, the habitat conditions are also slightly different, although it's in the same, it's the same hill. So it's the same climate, but the microclimate tends to change. And the litter is one of the biggest drivers of microbial communities and their physiology as well. Okay, well, thanks. So say, thank you everyone who has attended. Um, Ashish, make sure you go and check out the comments here. There's a lot of congratulatory uh, remarks and people um, um, uh, uh, expressing their, 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 um, their happiness with your talk. So make sure you go check out all the, all the, all the kudos in the comments section. Um, if you feel like you, you, your question didn't get answered, make sure to contact Ashish directly and um, Otherwise, we will see you guys at the next micro seminar. We have one next uh, next Wednesday, so stay tuned. You can also check out the schedule at microseminar.wordpress.com, and uh, we'll sign off here. Thank you so much for for being with us. Thank you so much. Thank you.